Welcome to our podcast. This is another recorded episode of Stay Classy San Diego at KCBQ with video production provided by Max Lux Media with your host, myself, Steve Wire. This podcast is dedicated to keeping you informed and engaged with the latest news and trending events in the San Diego region. Join us on a weekly exploration as we sit down with prominent political figures, insightful analysts, industry professionals, and influential community members. Um, so this is about as excited as I think I've ever been for an episode of this podcast. What are we on now? We're like 46. This is episode 46 of the podcast, Stay Classy San Diego. Um, but I don't think we've ever done anything quite like this before. So on my right here, we have John Julian, also known as Portash. Um, John is a singer, songwriter, and pump, uh, excuse me, punk, pop, and skate star. Um, he's a 25-year-old Southern California native. He grew up primarily in San Diego. Since his childhood, he's pursued his passions of music and skateboarding, made his professional debut when he was just 17 years old, and since then has delivered over a dozen singles and EPs. Currently, he works with industry heavyweights like Brennan Savage and Danny Way. He has connected with fans worldwide and has amassed a sizable following on social media and Spotify. His latest single is Bite Mark. Um, you should check it out. I just listened to it. It's it's an absolute banger. I appreciate um, you, Bill. Yeah, absolutely. So, and then on my left here, um, we have the Danny Way. Um, Danny Way is, um, in case you didn't know, uh, a pretty historic American professional skateboarder, company owner, and songwriter and producer. Um, we're really honored to have him on the show. He's known for quite a bit, um, and we're going to run through it in a second. So, um, we're going to talk about the skateboarding. We're also going to talk about the artistry, some of the collaborations. So. Uh, he's known for extreme stunts. He jumps onto a skateboarding ramp from a helicopter that was featured on the cover of Transworld Skateboarding Magazine. One of his more notable stunts was jumping the Great Wall of China on a skateboard via mega ramp. Um, Danny Wei is also, just in case I didn't say it already, is a San Diego native, is that correct? Um, and he has a long list of awards that I'm going to try to read off and correct me <laughs> if I miss anything. So All good. Uh, he's a six-time X Games gold medal winner. Um, Danny holds the world's record for um, biggest air. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Biggest air for this jump. Yeah, land um, speed record. But over the years, I've had to break my own records. So yeah, know. well, I was about to say you got ten total Guinness records, um, and that was partially because you broke your own record so many times. Correct. Right? Um, he established the first record and surpassed it himself. Danny was titled Skateboard of the Year by Thrasher Magazine twice. Um, he also. Uh, started the company, um, he also co-founded DC Shoes in 2004, Correct. is that right? Um, and then in 1991, he started uh, B8? Plan B. Or, or Plan B, sorry. Um, and then as far as music goes, there's a lot to mention. I'm going to read it off again. So we have... The skateboard company, Plan B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. Just to be clear, uh, yeah. for all of our listeners who are wondering what... We I were mean. first, don't worry. Yeah, yeah. We <laughs> Poor Bad Pit. Yeah, yeah. So the... The main thing that I want to highlight is that Danny, although he's a professional, uh, you know, obviously the, the skateboarding accomplishments are there, but also um, you've launched this historic career into musical artistry. You've collabed with some really famous names, and I'm going to read a few of those off right now. So uh, you've, you're have a musician who's played in several bands like uh, Escalera. He's also collaborated with artists such as Mod Sun, Stevie J Surfing, um, now Portash, who sits to my right. Um, but some of the other artists you've collaborated with include G-Eazy, Eric Wilson, Shwayze, Tommy Lee, um, funky Homo Sapier, uh, Travis Barker, Lil Tracy, um, as well as Sublime. Um, and we're going to talk about some of that because uh, actually there's an exciting upcoming project that involves Sublime um, that Portash is actually working on. And um, you also went on to create Eric's new band, Eric Wilson uh, of Sublime. You went on to create his new band, Spray Allen. Um, but I want to start out with talking a little bit about the musical I, stuff. I contributed to starting it. I was, I'd say I was a catalyst to getting it started, but we, you know, it was, everybody came together to make it work. But that's the current band, Eric's, you know, he's still doing Sublime, but his is his young new band that, that he's putting a lot of yeah. energy into. Um, as a huge Sublime fanboy, I really want to get into that, into the meat of how that collaboration happened, um, how, how this upcoming project is shaping out. Um, but first of all, I want to talk about a little bit about your backgrounds. I know we just read off a lot of accolades, but like what got um, you, Danny, into the musical scene? Obviously, you started out um, being this historic skateboarder, um, winning all these awards, winning all these um, competitions. And then at some point along your career, you decide, you know, I want to turn things, shake things up a bit. I want to start making music. I want to start producing. I want to start collabing. How did that happen? And sort of talk us through that transitional phase. Well, <clears throat> My my dad was uh, in a band, um, but he passed away when I was real young, like eight months old. So, you know, I grew up, <clears throat> and he had he had like a deal with Electra Records and was on tour with some pretty big name bands. So I always, you know, I had all of his instruments left behind growing up. My stepdad was a surfer, 
and and was the guy that started taking me to the skate park at a real young age. So like, that was my influence growing up. I had all these beautiful Gibson guitars and like all these, you know, such a, um, you know, library of music, musical instruments. And, uh, and then also knowing like how, how to, like, how can I connect with my dad? So at some point I realized <clears throat> the only way I could do it is trying to, you know, kind of jump into what his life is like and um, fell in love with playing guitar at a pretty young age and, you know, went on to start buying like recording equipment and, you know, playing with different people and eventually got to a point where um, Stevie J, one of the, you know, Stevie Jordan, famous producer for, you know, producing like Biggie and um, Mariah Carey, Beyonce, Jay-Z, um, he, he was just kind of needed to like, get out of New York for a little while. He was living in LA and then he was gonna burn out of that. And I had an extra house at the time that I wasn't renting. And so I let him come stay with me. And um, I had this, you know, at DC, we had a really amazing indoor skate park and there was just tons of room under one of the, the vert ramp. And uh, we looked at it like, wow, this would be the ultimate, like, you know, or, get, or uh, authentic way to do this. Like, you know, music culture and skate culture are super aligned. Um, and art, so fashion, art, music, skateboarding, there's there's a, such a big connection between all those things. And so Stevie came and lived with me for a while, started teaching me how to produce, he helped me build the studio. And uh, that's kind of what set that whole, you know, like I had a ton of love for music, but once I really got into that side of it and was getting mentored by one of the most famous, famous producers of his time, um, that's when it really took off and my, my, you know, my passion went to a whole nother level. Sure. So. Um, can you talk about like sort of because uh, I, I think that there's like obviously m many sides to you and like, you know, there's a the skateboarding side, there's the artist side. But like in terms of how skating like sort of and that culture sort of influences the artistry that you do, can you like kind of talk about that, like that inspirational um, like magic, how that how that like plays into what you do now? Well, skateboarding's you know, <clears throat> skateboarding videos have been such a huge vehicle for up and coming bands. Um, you know, bands or artists that haven't had, you know, before the internet, before there was all this, these different ways and digital platforms to showcase or premiere your music. You know, skate videos had worldwide distribution in the 80s and in the 90s, um, before that was really, you know, before all of that really was developed for the artists. Um, so, you know, a lot of underground bands would come to the skate, you know, we would find these bands just because we love music and music, you know, when you're skating, you're always playing music, you know, there's some, synergy just you know culturally there's a lot of alignment between the you know creative musicians and skateboarders um so that you know that's really how a lot of it came together um but yeah the the um you know the you know even down to the art on skateboards you know skateboarding is like a huge influence on on streetwear fashion but it all converges at some level and uh so you know i think that's the biggest catalyst to like where I'm at now is recognizing that there's all these, you know, there's these subcultures that are aligned and, you know, these bands that we worked with, like, if you look at like one of our first Plan B videos, like Green Day's in there, Bad Religion, all these, you know, Della Funky, Homo Sapien, Hieroglyphics, like all these legacy bands now that had no essentially, you know, visibility around the world. So I ran into Trey from Green Day not too long ago and he was like, man, you guys sent us the free, free, first free box of clothes we ever got. And like, I'd go see Green Day, I'd play at like Shea Cafe at UCSD or whatever. And then there's like only like 30 people there, you know? And then two years later, they're selling out stadiums. But those guys give a lot of credit back to the skate videos. Yeah, So no, uh, I, uh, and, and one thing that I wanna do is also talk about uh, some of the, as I said before, like some of the artists who work with sort of how those connections happen, like yeah. sort of how that networking started. But, but first of all, like John, I wanna talk to you for a second. Like what about um, your life and your background sort of got you into making music? Was it, um, did like skating sort of transition into um, artistry, like in terms of making music and sort of that, that culture? Uh, the connection or what what happened it was kind of the opposite it's kind of backwards so okay. i was always doing music um i grew up in a christian family uh we were going to church we were singing at all the time um so my brother was this rock star kind of raver guy that just put me on to so much cool music that you know kind of like some screamo punk stuff 
that nobody was really listening to. And if you were at the time, you were edgy and you were cool. And that was that was the cool thing to be doing. So basically, as a young kid, he was he was my idol and um, he just got me into music. He would play the guitar. I would write songs. We would just have a great time together. And then skateboarding came shortly after that. Um, I was kind of a nerd growing up, kind of just like, you know, homebodies, always at the house. And uh, my neighbor, uh, Will Fiok, he was a great skateboarder when we were younger. And he would come by the house and be like, hey man, you gotta pick up the skateboard and uh, you, gotta, you gotta come like roll down the street with me. And I was always so scared at first. I was about probably seven years old. And then, I just started I just started trying it. I just started going for it and eventually it turned into something way bigger than I ever thought. I was never at my house anymore. I was always in the streets skating. I didn't grow up skating ramps. Um, a lot of these kids who grew up in Southern California would have the YMCA to go skate the vert ramp or you know uh, you know the street courses and stuff like that but I was always just let's go find a loading dock. let's go find like a cool street spot to get a clip on and I got a camera at a young age and basically just started filming all my friends and it turned into something really great, so. Yeah, that's awesome. So um, now I wanna make the connection here. Talk about how the two of you got acquainted, like sort of how that connection happened. And- So um, epic, dude. Yeah, let's, let's go for <laughs> so it. So epic. So, you know, I've known who Danny Way was since I started skateboarding. I mean, he is the pioneer of all this stuff, so he, was a big inspiration. I grew up in the same area, you know, Encinitas is the mecca of all this stuff. So skateboarding, we have some of the best skate parks in the world. Everyone from all over the world is coming to San Diego to skateboard, to either train. We have the Olympic training facility over there in Vista. Um, so that's where all these guys are coming to. So growing up, you kind of, you know, I, I went to the YMCA when I was younger. I would meet a lot of people, but meeting Danny was a whole entire different thing. Um, I was started making music. I started recording myself um, about like 15, 16. Um, wow. Just doing GarageBand, Apple headphones, and just seeing what I could do with it. And people started to pick up on it. You know, I would go to parties and play my music and people started to pick up. People started to like it. And um, eventually where it got out, I ended up in Danny's studio one day over at his uh, house in Encinitas. And we met and I don't know if he was too stoked on me at first, but um, we made a track and everything changed right there. We, he laid down some acoustic and I laid down some vocals and it was history after that, man. We just were tight. I was definitely yeah. stoked on him. I was like, <clears throat> I wanted to see what his skate credentials were though. Sure, like, I, sure. He, 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 was, he grew up you know, in my, son, my son's era, so my son knew who he was um, and I would just hear things, but I hadn't really seen him like personally skate. So like I knew he had a voice and he had the passion. So we had, you know, once I went to the skate park, watched him skate, I was like, well, this kid's talented, man. He's well, he's got it all. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I wanted to, to get back to you, Danny, like in terms of um, the, the way that you got involved in music, you already talked about that transitional period, but as far as the music you're producing now, um, I want to give you some time to talk about some of the, the specific tracks, some of the specific projects. Uh, that are that are recent and up and coming um, but talk to me a little bit about the uh, sort of the inspirations as well for some of these tracks like sort of uh, how uh, you know everybody has you know artists that they feel inspired by or certain motivations like maybe it's something about their background their history something yeah. they went through that motivates their music like what is it for you that sort of gives you your specific artistic flavor and like kind of apply that to some of the specific tracks that you're working on now well i mean <clears throat> i look at it like it's to me it's like it stimulates the same like whatever part of my brain that skateboarding does as far as creativity goes but you're not getting hurt doing it so like i get hurt a lot and <laughs> there's a lot of time i have off because of that and sometimes when i get hurt i'm like well at least i got three months to make music you know and can keep that stimulation going but um you know it, it's it it's the influence like for me, you know, I, I just play it what comes out. Like I, I have a, you know, whatever my own style that I uh, that that how I play guitar and um, how I operate, you know, how I produce on Pro Tools or whatever it is. And um, but it's you know, I would say that most of my inspiration, you know, for the like the riffs that I write and the moods of those riffs, are, they come from like 
I mean, I don't know. Like, I don't typically make too happy of stuff. Like, it's not super depressing, but there's, it's always in, like, a lot of it's always in minor. You know, I, I it, it's, you know, try to, try to kind of hit a, like, a melodic, that, you know, sort of vibe. And, you know, I grew up on, like, Metallica and Iron Maiden and Sabbath. Like, those are, like, my biggest inspirational bands, you know? And then I went through a you know big punk rock phase, hardcore punk rock. Um, so like, you, like any, any, I mean, you know, if it's you know Minor Threat, you know, the Sex Pistols, Circle Jerks, <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever. There's a list of them. But um, so yeah, I mean, it was you know punk rock back then wasn't like it is today. You know, pop punk kind of pop you know cracked off in the early '90s, and you know bands like. Bad Religion kind of were on the edge of that. And then all of a sudden you see bands like, you know, uh, Blink-182 emerging and it kind of getting more pop and more pop. But yeah, the era that I was really, you know, into punk rock per se the most was when it was more hardcore, like more heavy, not as, not as you know, pop minded, yeah. but. Um, and now for John, like, is it like similar in terms of uh, like the inspirations or like uh, what specifically like the music you now, like we talked the, I think I mentioned in the intro, we talked about like Bite Mark. Yeah. Um, and there was also uh, some some other music that I, I was listening to um, before this interview from you. And I'm just curious like what the inspirations were for some of those tracks. Can you talk through like- Yeah, definitely. I was uh, gonna say Danny's being modest. He's a rock star he's so good on the guitar and he's always busting out crazy new riffs. But um, as far as inspiration for me, uh, Metro Station, you know, Panic at the Disco. I love this upbeat kind of vibe, the party stuff. So that was mainly it. And then um, basically, you know, I like a lot of I like a lot of R and B. I like a lot of hip hop. I mean, I listen to rap music when I'm trying to get hyped up. So it's like, you know, Chris Brown's Cool to Me, Justin Bieber, all that stuff. I'll listen to any of that. And that's that's not necessarily where I'm going with it. But these guys push it to a limit. That's so incredible and just amazing that they're able to make a career and make a name that's as big as Michael Jackson and you know legends like that so you know listening to artists is always a new it's like a project for me I study new artists I always am trying to find new artists I don't like listening to the same person so if somebody's coming up and you know I, I see them I'm gonna invest my time and be like okay what's this guy doing different that other people aren't that makes them special because sure. they're in the limelight right now. So, mm -hmm. is there any like particular artists, maybe one of the ones you mentioned, where you're like, man, like, if my career goes according to plan, my music, like my my legacy will look something like this. Or, Dang, or, you know, or, I feel like I'm doing something that no one ever has before, and I just want to be in that lane. I want to be me, and I want to be a skateboarder. I want to be a music artist at the same time. And I don't really, couldn't really name anybody. And you know, I'm telling a story that might not be that relatable to the masses. And I wanna find that happy medium where I can relate to people and you know, serve a purpose with the music that I'm writing and delivering. Yeah, I, I mean, just talking to you for the last few minutes, it's like obvious, your passion, it's obvious that you're trying to find your own niche and that's respectable. I think, I was just thinking of a, a quote from um, Kobe Bryant who said like something along the lines of, I don't wanna be the next Michael Jordan, I wanna be the only Kobe Bryant. And I Love feel that. like, you know, obviously basketball, but it applies to artistry in terms of, you know, not, not just wanting to, I mean, you obviously have inspirations, you both have inspirations, but yeah, it's about course. like hard, you know, niche being yourself as much as possible. And from listening to your music, it's it's unique. It's not like, uh, you know, it's like, oh, it doesn't, it's not like this guy or that guy. It's like, okay, this is something new. This is something distinct. And this is like a, a new sound. It's hard to do that. Yeah, it know? is hard to do a that. A lot of people will listen and then, you know, it's a, and it's hard for me to not, sometimes I'll stumble across, I'll be like, wait, did I do that just because I heard that one song and I like that? Or, you know, I kind of have to trick myself into just being myself. So it's, yeah, you know, it's by, a bit weird. By the way, I really like the, the music video for Lost Our Chance. Do you want to talk about that for a second? Like Thank what, so uh, much, what went into yeah. that? Like, what was the, um, like sort of what were, I'm curious to, like, I haven't listened to the song, like sort of what, what was the inspiration for that song? Um, and like sort of what were some of the themes that like played out in that Basically in that just girls like being stupid and hurting me. No, but um, that's actually a cool one because that was the first time I worked with Spray Allen in Sublime. So Eric Wilson and uh, Daniel Lawner is his name. He's a kid from New York that uh, came to Danny and they set up the Spray Allen band with Eric Wilson from Sublime. He plays the bass. 
Daniel Longer's the lead singer and Eric Sherman's the uh, guitarist. So that was the first time I got to work with them on a huge song and we loved it. I mean, I, I kind of had the melody already and I came into the Sublime house, pretty nerve wracking, you know, I was a big fan of Sublime. And so I came in there and I was like, yeah, like, yeah, I'm doing this, blah, blah, blah. So they laid it down. I, I, I originally did and they did the guitar behind it, started getting into production. It turned out pretty good. And I was like, let's do a video. So basically reached out to some uh, kids from my high school um, that got into videography and uh, they were working on their Red Bull records or you know, something like that. And we all made it happen. And uh, just one day in LA, we got Bruce Irons, a legendary surfer to do a cameo in the end. Cause I love to make things funny, man. I'm not just trying to make this, you know, music's one thing, but it's all entertainment at the end of the day. And we love to, you know, add a little spice to things. So um, Bruce Irons acts as the director in the end of the video. I don't know if you saw that part, but um, yeah. So that's how that came together. It was fun and uh, can't wait to do it again. Well, um, as I mentioned before, I'm a big Sublime fanboy. So let's talk about that for a second. The the collaboration with Sublime, um, Danny, can you, can you talk a little bit about how that sort of connection started? And then um, if either one of you want to talk about the upcoming project, um, go ahead. But sure. Danny, you want to start? Yeah. Um, I have a, a producer friend that lives in LA named Rex Kudo. Rex is known for producing Post Malone's first album, White, White Iverson. Um, <clears throat> he was super busy at the time, but there was, you know, these, uh, through another friend of mine, another skateboarder named Jeremy Rogers that was friends with Rex as well. And Jeremy and I were, you know, Jeremy was coming out of my house from LA all the time and we were trying to collaborate and trying to figure out how to create this band. And he was like, Rex, you know, told me about these kids. Well, they're in their tw early 20s at the time. You know, f they're not kid kids, but whatever. They're that are f kind of floating in LA right now that are from New York that, you know, he, Rex doesn't have the, the bandwidth to, to, to do anything with them at this moment. And Rex knew I had a studio. So he hit me up and was like, hey man, I have these amazing kids. Like these kids can produce, they can play every instrument. Um, you know, if you have time and you want to take them in, I think you'd be, I think you'd be really happy with what, what you guys come up with. And so he's like, I'm here if you need me, but you know, get, just if you can't do it, I get it. But I was like, no way, I want to check these kids out and had them come down, took the, they took the train down from LA and came to my studio. And we literally locked the door for like three months and wrote like 40 to 50, something, 50 songs. And I was just like, wow, I can't believe how talented these guys are. You know, Daniel Lawner and Eric Sherman, there's two Eric's in Spray Out, but little Sherman, um, it was just like, I could not believe that, you know, these guys were just kind of floating around um, trying to figure something out when they're so, you know, talented and you'd think somebody would grab them in two seconds, but they just, yeah, anyways, they came through. And then at some point we realized like, you know, we need to bring in a bassist. Although Eric Sherman can play bass, like we could get it all done, but we like, we need a live, we need a drummer. So I'm good friends with a guy named Wade um, Human. He's a drummer from a San Diego band called Unwritten Law. So I hit up Wade and he's also friends with Eric from Sublime. And I was like, hey, you know, let's grab Eric and let's grab you. And you guys got to come meet these guys that I, that I have in my studio. And I think you guys could do some amazing work together. And I, you know, I'm not trying to be a rock star on stage. Like I'm, you know, I'm, Old, like I've done so much and I'm, I'm not trying to like tra you know do that all over again I traveled the world in, in vans and slept in so many small hotel rooms with so many people and have gone through that and I'm at a different stage in my life so I was more like I just want to kind of be you know the catalyst or the, the guy behind the scenes that's helping align all this stuff and and uh, so that's how the, the band was formed and is you know we had Eric Wilson come over and right away he was like man can I can I like move these kids into my house? I got this big house and I got all these extra rooms and I'll take care of these guys and I want to start this band. And I was like, please, dude, that's like these guys' dream. So anyways, that's that's what happened. And it's like, what, we're going on like two or three years later now. And those guys just got, they just went on tour again. They're writing another record right now and things are starting to take off. And it's pretty rad to like, you know, to, to you know, water the plant and watch, you know, see it blossom, you know, it's like, uh, and that's kind of what's happening right now. I'm watching these guys like, 
you know, it all come together for them, which is such a great feeling because I've had that happen to me, you know, and I've, and I've had a long career and I'm so grateful for all the things that align for me and, you know, and the people that believed in me. So that's a big part of my mo motivation is like, I'm not like selfish in it. Like I'm not doing it for money. Um, you know, I've done well with my skateboarding career and I don't you know, necessarily, it's not driven by like, oh, we're gonna get rich, you know, if everything happens the way that it's happening. And I mean, maybe that will happen, but that's just like, you know, that's just one, that one piece of it that I don't even stare at, you know, it's like. Yeah, you love the process. That's, it's everything. It's like, yeah, so, and I love seeing other people succeed. You know, I love more than anything. And that's, you know, like I'm working with John and, and I brought him in, introduced him to these guys and like, you know, and there's another group of friends I have in LA. One of them was, you know, had done the first track with John and I. His name's Tanner Johnson, amazing producer, songwriter, artist. He's he's a, and another and then there's another guy named Dre. Is he goes by Since When, and so I started connecting all of these guys and introducing them to each other, and we've have formed this like an amazing like uh, bubble of like super super talented, humble, you know, artists that and producers that synergize so well together. Hey, stay classy listeners and book lovers, mark your calendars. On October 21st at 6.30 p.m., journey through time and emotion with Molly Wire's latest masterpiece, Californian. Unveil the secrets of 1920s Pasadena, mid-century La Jolla, and the soulful 70s Central Coast. Engage in lively discussion, meet the author, and celebrate the power of storytelling at Bird Rock Coffee Roasters in La Jolla. Don't miss this unique literary experience. John, I wanted to turn to you for a second. So as far yeah. as uh, the collab with Sublime, um, yeah. I mean, we can call it a collab, right? I mean, I, I, I want you to talk about the project, yeah. like in terms of, of um, how it's playing out right now, like what, what started it, um, any details about what you can say about what it's gonna look like. And yeah, I mean, what, what's it like working with those yeah. guys? I mean, as Danny said, you know, he brought me into all this. So it was cool to just basically make some new friends. And um, yeah, we, we got about seven or eight songs ready to go. Got a couple music videos ready to go. Ideally, how it would turn out is, you know, go on maybe doing a little tour. That's not decided yet, but we'll be dropping it before the end of the year, as long as some bonus projects. So working with a lot of other producers as well, but this one is very special to me because it's, you know, all acoustic. There's no, there's no, all you know, high-end production. It's not too crazy, like, all over the place so it's just basically like pretty raw and you know and it comes from comes from me and these guys were really uh, big players in helping me find my writing and uh, just making me the best songwriter I could be and artist and finding my tone and my pitch and they helped me out a lot so sure um, any um, not to spoil the whole thing but um, yeah. as far as the I know you said it's going to be a lot of um, acoustics, um, yeah. you know, not a super high end thing, but uh, can you give us any details about like sort of themes, um, sort of anything along those lines? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's always the, you know, I, people don't always talk about what they're happy about. You know, there's a lot of sad stuff in there, a lot of, uh, you know, struggling with, um, you know, just life's problems, um, addiction of some sort, you know, just basically trying to relate to uh, the, the masses like what people are going through right now it's it's a crazy world and you know this modern day world right now with uh partying and kids just going crazy it's not safe and to be vocal about that is really huge and just to be able to have my take on it from experience is something that i think people needed to hear so. absolutely i mean i want to touch on that for a second like i mean i i think that the theme of you know addiction recovery um I think that's huge for like people our age. Like, yeah. um, you know, I'm 25 myself, and I, I think that like, yeah, as far as the uh, so, sort of just like people who are living in San Diego, people who are you know exposed to, you know, it's it's sort of known as a party city, um, but there's also like a lot of uh, you know people who struggle with addiction. I mean, it's not unique to San Diego, but no. um, it's a universal thing. It's a universal human problem, and so sort of talk to me a little bit about like how. Uh, as, as much as you want to share just sort of how that shapes your artistry and sort of how that shapes like what you what you write about. I think a lot of people in San Diego are good at hiding it and pretending that, you know, it's a 
you know, they're they're above. I don't know. Cal Southern California is just different than the rest of the states, but it's yeah, you know, it's something that I struggled with from a young age. You know, getting into skateboarding. You know, there was a lot of marijuana at a young age, and then it, you know it gets to other things, and then you start to party, and it's it's a lifestyle that you think you want to live until it breaks you down, and. I was lucky enough to have mentors to be like, hey, kid, you're not doing it right at a young age. So it worked out better for me. But, you know, a lot of people who are going through that kind of thing, it's like they might have parents who are drinking a lot of alcohol and, you know, they, their homes might not be the safest place to be. And I learned that the hard way, like by going to, you know, meetings and stuff like that or whatever, you know, doing my doing my research. Let's just put it that way. And um, it it worked out for me, but it's just so hard to tell each and every individual how it's gonna work out because it's so socially acceptable to be drinking on the weekends and doing that kind of thing. And, you know, with you know, life's, life's tough, man. I mean, the economy and everything going on is just, people wanna let loose and just not not be a part of every, like every second of the day. So sure. it's hard to pinpoint every person's problems, but if I could just, you know, relate to some people, that's enough for me. Yeah, Danny, I don't know if you want to touch on this, but um, and if not, that's fine. But as far as like the level of fame that you achieved in the skateboarding world and now um, in the musical scene, um, do you sort of relate at all to what John's talking about in terms of sort of the pressures of the lifestyle and, um, you know, the sort of the unique challenges that come along with that as well as the good stuff? 100%. I mean, you know, it's not just this era that's dealing with that. I was dealing with it when I was a kid, too, and it's, you know, Partying's been around since, you know, it goes deep, you know. I grew up with a mom that struggled hard with addiction. Skateboarding was my savior, you know, like my skate crew when I was a kid, like that was my family. I was never home. I was doing everything I could to stay busy, stay athletic and stay out of trouble. And the skateboarding was like, you know, it wasn't the safest place because it's, you know, it's, it's not like most, you know, or sports organizations, you know, you have a lot of freedom because you're, you know, you might be a part of a team, but, you know, you don't have <clears throat> the same kind of, um, I think, pressure of, of, of maintaining responsibility as you do in some big pro ball sport organizations or whatever. It's pretty, you're out for, you know, you gotta, you gotta be on your game and, you know, and if you're not, the next guy's gonna take your spot. So it's, it's, yeah, I've seen, you know, and I've gone through my phases too, and, and you know it's it's not an easy road. But you know, skateboarding has you know one thing. One of my mentors taught me when I was younger is like one day skateboarding will be in the Olympics, and finally people are going to have to be professional athletes. Like skateboarding, are, you know, you're at, it takes a lot of athleticism to be a great skateboarder. But there's a lot of skateboarders that don't look at themselves as athletes. You know, they live this lifestyle and. and they wouldn't want to be called an athlete per se, but a skateboarder is like, you know, its own identity. And, um, but yeah, that's, you know, skateboarding is now an Olympic sport. Huge corporations have come into skateboarding. There's so much opportunity, you know, for people to make money and, and you know, to make a living and, and be, you know, be able to retire off, you know, something like skateboarding is crazy, you know, and to have that opportunity is a gift. So I think, um, you know, I've watched it unfold from from skateboarding being super, you know, in the 80s, it was so popular. Vert skating was so faint, like, you know, that's like an era where, you know, there was so much corporate money going into skateboarding. And then in the early 90s, like street skating started to emerge because vert, all the vert ramps, you know, like with liability, whatever, started disappearing. And, you know, kids didn't have these backyards of skate ramps anymore and were forced out into the streets. and you know, got, became part of street culture, you know, and street skating in the cities and in the urban environments was like what the next phase was through the 90s. And it put skateboarding like, you know, there wasn't a lot of big corporate companies interested just because of how reckless it looked. And and then X Games came around in, in the mid 90s and, you know, put skate, put vert skating back on the map and um, started bringing in big corporate sponsors and giving, you know, a whole nother sort of main, an opportunity for mainstream exposure and you know kids were becoming really famous and you know at that point my mentor at a young age just said hey watch you know you better stay on your game because skateboarding will be an olympic sport in your career lifetime and it is Here we are. but i'm not you know at this stage i've you know I, I feel like i'm not 
if they brought in the mega ramp to the Olympics, which I've been pushing for hard, I would jump back in. But you know, I let. You think it'll ever happen? Or I'm I'm trying so hard, but I'm like the most you know visually spectacle genre of skateboarding is watching mega ramp. It's the most dangerous. It's, it doesn't. You don't need to know anything about skateboarding to get it. You know, if you watch a, a street contest, if you don't, it's like. It's, it's like trying to understand Spanish if you're, you know, if you don't speak Spanish or whatever. And the, there's so much technicality to it. And, you, you know, if you didn't know what was going on, you wouldn't understand the level of difficulty. Uh, so you might be impressed with the, wit, the wit, uh, you know, the wittiness of some people's ability, you know, skill sets. But if you watch a vert contest or a mega ramp contest, it's like you don't need to know what a trick name's called. You're just be, wow, that guy just blasted through the air and flipped and spun. And so from a spectator standpoint, you know, Vert's not even in the Olympics yet, which is crazy. Um, I know that they're pushing for that right now, but my vision is, you know, mega ramp, you know, there's, you can create a non-judged genre of Olympic skateboarding with high air contest, like who can go the biggest. And it's a metered thing. And it seems like for me, being an Olympic, it seems like the most Olympic minded thing when you're looking at like, you know, people sprinting and, and jumping and distances where it's straightforward. You don't need judges, you know, it's just metered. So it would be really amazing if skateboarding was in the Olympics in that way, where it's just like so simple, just how big can you blast? And, sure. and so wow. that's my dream right now. So, and I do know the Olympic, you know, the guys that are driving the Olympic committee for skateboarding. and. I've been pitching all this stuff, so we'll see, sure. I, I hope. You really, um, along with a select few, uh, I would say, in my opinion, helped put professional skateboarding really in the mainstream eye, helped put it on the map, and now it's a, now it's an Olympic event, um, and you know, we're pushing, obviously you're pushing for, for that to expand, but specifically, can you talk about um, how professional skateboarding in your era has evolved over time um, to the point it is now? I mean, it seems like it's getting bigger. I mean, obviously the Olympics is huge, but um, as far as <clears throat> professional skateboarding and your influence on the sport, um, can you sort of speak to that from a, like almost an external perspective, like how you how you've seen that progress over time under the influence of people such as yourself, Tony Hawk, and others? Yeah, um, you know, I, I'm I think eight years t younger than Tony. We both grew up at Del Mar Skate Ranch. Um, I went there and like you know first time it was like 1981 or so. Um, I was a little kid, uh, six or seven years old, and Tony was almost pro, and he was like already, you know, everyone thought like, oh, this is the next, Tony's gonna be the guy right now. So I, you know, I'm, I'm barely learning how to skate watching Tony. And, you know, there was like a whole movement of, you know, back then it was pool skating, because there, was, there wasn't ramps, but once Del Mar got shut down, you know, I think it was 88 or 87, um, then the next frontier was like, how do we emulate this? So, people started building half pipes. So the next the, the next movement was vert skating, which is a half pipe. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, a lot of the, the, the tricks that were invented in the 80s, you know, kind of translated to vert. And then street skating started happening in the mid 80s. And like, I, you know, grew up in a, a, a crew of kids. One of my good friends is a guy named, ha you know, I went, lived, went to the same schools as, learned how to drop in on, you know, at the same time. Um, he, we had a skate crew in Vista and his name is Matt Hensley. He's the, he started the band of Flog and Mollies and they're doing really well. Um, but he left pro skateboarding to do the band, but he was one of the most innovative street skaters in the world. But these are, I was, you know, I grew up in a bubble of skateboarders that were like, okay, we can't skate the ramp today because it's locked up or, you know, so-and-so's not home or the session's too big. We're like, what do we do? We go street skate. So my biggest, you know, I'd say contribution, you know, and we'll get to the mega ramp thing, but the, the most thing, you know, when I look at what I've done and the, what I'm most proud of is, is trying to merge all genres of skateboarding into one mindset. So, you know, the level of progression in, in you, know, that, you know, from street skating from 1985 to 1991, like it totally re was a revolution like this, you know, people started learning how to control their board without grabbing it. You know, you the flip tricks and the, and the control and the style and all that stuff and the skate spots, you know, hitting rails and big ledges and just looking at the urban landscape with a different perspective. And that, <clears throat> my, you know, I started taking all of that, those tricks I had learned on the street to the vert ramp. 
And then I saw like the separation between vert skating and street skating. And my thing was like, I want to just want to be all universal and skate the vert ramp like I would think if I was out skating street. So, you know, I, I started to be known, you know, in the early 90s, vert was pretty dead, but the street skating community appreciated, you know, I'd put out video parts that they'd be like, well, those are the same tricks we're doing, but he's just doing them on the vert ramp. So there was like, you know, the vert guys that had vert tricks. And then there was, you know, my friend Colin McKay that I own Plan B Skateboards with. There was a couple of us that had this new perspective on how to, you know, skate vert where we could get the street skating culture to back us. Because there was no other opportunity if you're a vert skater in the early 90s. Like your Tony retired in that time period for a little while before X Games started. Nobody was making money. Guys were like, what do we do next? And the you know, street, street skaters took over skateboarding. So if you didn't street skate and you weren't respected by the street culture, it was a game over. Right. So, after, you know, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say like, I think it's, it's one thing hearing from you, but uh, the reality is, is that, you know, you're being humble and like the influence that you've had on the, the sport, like John, do you wanna like talk a little bit about from, you know, uh, Danny's, you know, underselling himself, like, I mean, like, can you talk a little bit about just like as far as the influence that Danny's had on the sport, a little it's bit about insane, how uh, maybe some of your other influences too, but sort of just the influence on San Diego skate culture oh, for and sure. skate culture at large. I mean, as you said, it's like, you know, before it was like punk rock, cigarettes and beer, and now it's like yoga and acai bowls. And it's like, it's an <laughs> Olympic sport now. So this is what all me and my friends talk about. I mean, we got Corey Juno from San Diego who got bronze. So that was really cool. We got. San Diego representing the Olympic sport. So from it, how it's changed since I was a kid, I mean, I'm not hopping fences and, and skating schools anymore, how I used to be. But I mean, a lot of kids will do whatever they can to skate their dream spot. And that's kind of changed in our area because we have so much accessibility to skate parks. And, you know, I don't know how it's changed as far as their progression, but all I know is these kids are getting next level good and all over the world. It's like, as soon as it hit the Olympics, Japan, boom, best skaters. And then, you know, just Brazil, everywhere, all over the world, it's just getting crazy. So as soon as it hit the Olympics, it's kind of anyone's game. And that's uh, made, a, made a lot of the San Diego, LA, just United States guys step up a lot, so. Sure, absolutely. And I want to talk a little bit about as far as uh, you know, going back to the musical side of things, John, like, yeah, yeah. um, you, um, obviously, you know, you grew up in San Diego, you, um, you've talked about a little bit about your inspirations, but going forward, um, do you like, like what kind of music do you like want to make? Because we've talked about the music you've already made, but going forward, you know, things go according to plan. Like what kind of music do you want to make? And like, what does that look like for you in terms of, you know, maybe upcoming, upcoming tracks you can talk about, um, yeah, you upcoming know, albums? As far as that, I want to make music that's good for families, that's good for my friends, that you know my friends will like it and my little nieces and nephews could listen to. I want to make music that's for everybody, which is hard for me because of the life that I've experienced. But finding that happy medium, like I said before, is just kind of where my direction is. So as far as finding my niche, and I mean, I found my sound. I've been making the same kind of music for a long time now, but finding where you want to take it and how you want to, you know, because it always changes from album to project to whatever you're working on at the time, it's always going to change. But, you know, as far as right now, I could tell you it's just making family friendly music that can work in clubs and work in a fine dining restaurant or work at a family dinner table or whatever. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, and turning back to you, Danny, <clears throat> as far as upcoming projects, upcoming music you want people to know about. Um, we talked about a lot of the collabs at the beginning. Yeah. Are there any specific ones in there that you sort of want, want to shout out? Any Anybody you're working on with now that um, is sort of going to shape your musical career going forward? Yeah, I mean, obviously I have a lot of loyalty to John. You know, I work with the Spray Allen guys quite a bit. Um, those guys, you know, even though they're in Spray Allen, my friend Dan uh, Lawner, we call him, or Sherman will jump in on a, on a project with us. You know, I have my friend Tanner and, and Dre that live in LA. Um, I've got an agency that I've been working with for a few years. So we're, we're actually, I met these guys and been working on this like early 90s street skating documentary, which is the whole ex story I just explained, like the revolution of vert dying and skateboarding influencing music culture and 
art culture, street fashion, and how all this converged. So I'm actually making a, a documentary that will be done pretty soon um, with these guys. But they also, it's, you know, they own this, um, you know, agency called The Penthouse in Beverly Hills. And it's, they've got like a few studios there. Um, they have A&R there. They're, they're, you know, they, they're li they have their own record label, but they're also aligned with some of the majors. And um, they're, they're basically just, you know, a, an amazing platform for us to plug into because they have everything in place. So what we've been trying to work on is, you know, bringing this whole concept of merging all of these things together. So if it's like, you know, there's there's a pro skateboarder named Deshaun Jordan that we're, t that we're working with right now. Um, and the, the goal with him is, you know, he's, he's got, he's putting out music right now that they're, they're, they're like, wow, this has got like Bieber potential. Um, and he's been working with some of the producers that I just dropped those, uh, you know, the names of another guy named Zaba. So I was like, I don't know what, like, let's put all these chefs in one kitchen. All these guys get along super good. Everyone respects each other. It's very egoless. And I, and I see this vision of like, you know, you know, you see a skateboarder, he'll skate, like Zashan skates for Nike. He's got like a big Nike deal on the table. You know, he's good friends with Pharrell, which is now one of the head designers at Louis Vuitton. And I just see this vision of being able to converge all of the, you know, the brands and the bands into one capsule. And yeah. so like we drop a single, you know, not, and, and we bring in a famous street artist like Retina or somebody, you know, a well-respected graffiti or whatever, you know, and I have a bunch of those guys on, obviously on, on my mind, but just to keep it simple, we'll just say, you know, using an art artist, not a musician, but, you know, a real illustration artist or whoever, painter, to come in and to set a theme for a, a capsule, you know, and, and tie those products in with each of the brands and drop music with it and let all of that tell the story in a merch capsule, you know, that's like, limited edition, you know, we make 300 of these and they're, they're one and done. And, and and it pushes the whole story, it ties everything together. And it, it's not been done that way yet. Like nobody's, you know, we put music in skate videos before, our skateboarders have clothing sponsors and shoe sponsors and, but I have not seen one person or, you know, one collaboration where everybody's come together to push something. Yeah. And it's, you know, you have massive brands like Nike and Louis Vuitton and all these like Supreme or whatever. And, you know, the mm -hmm. amount of power you can put behind that is is crazy, you know? Yeah. It seems like you're, correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like you're almost this very like unifying figure in the industry where you're like pulling all these different talents together. You're, you're creating this talent pool and then sort of seeing like, what, 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 what can we make happen if we put all these people in the same room? And yeah. I really admire that. And let's um, tell the story th and let other people be a part of it. You know, by being able to rep the hoodie or, the, you know, the jacket or whatever, the, wear the backpack and like, you know, everyone like, you know, so everyone feels like they can be a part of this whole movement. And I feel like that's like the ultimate souvenir is like being able to have the limited edition pieces that we make. And, you know, the story behind those are, you know, everything has a story and it's and it's just all these amazing, talented human beings that you know, that are already so well respected, just putting them into a cast and doing these amazing drops, you know? Yeah. What yeah. Uh, What was the name of the documentary again that's coming out? We don't have, we have a couple of placeholder names, okay. but it's, it's almost done. So, you Where know, we'll find it or, um, well, it'll, it'll, it'll be advertised pretty heavily. It's, okay. um, so it, it's like, you know, we're, we're at, we're, we're, we're at our last couple of cuts probably. Um, it's, you know, it, COVID slowed us down pretty hard. Yeah, but we're back on it and you know we're like i just had a meeting last week about it so we do have a list of names we we'll just haven't nailed one down so i don't want to drop something yet without the right you know without that right branding yeah. but it's uh i think you know this this will also tell the story of the catalyst of all of what i'm trying to do right now how it all kind of came together in that way that get, is giving us the ability today to do it you know with all these amazing people that you know have tons of respect and legacy so sure yeah and the final minutes we have like any other like collabs you want to highlight i mean there were so many people we talked about you know we yeah. talked about yeah. uh you know how you've done work with jeezy you've done work with Swayze, you've done work with tommy lee like can you talk a bit about in addition to the sublime stuff um which i could talk about all day because i love yeah. sublime but can, can you talk about like any of the other collabs um and like maybe how uh some of the music that's come out of that or maybe something that's up and coming that people can look forward to so like history of collabs 
Um, well, yeah, just like collabs that, that have happened, maybe something you want to highlight or, so, or maybe an upcoming collab like that people can like keep an eye out for. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm working with this young group of producers and art and artists right now. And I'm, you know, I'm trying to look through the lens of what they see is like relevant. That's how I got, you know, I'm getting older and, and the way I'm maintaining my relevance is aligning with the kids that are moving the needle right now, or just a younger generation that has got their finger on the pulse, you know, but the things I've done in the past, you know, if it's, you know, DC shoes and giving, you know, having Travis Barker's signature shoes and Mike Shinoda from Lincoln Park, you know, having his own line of products. And the one missing piece that I saw the vision back then was like, we need to tie in the music. We got Travis Barker and we got, you know, Mike Shinoda, we have, we corn we have all these major you know amazing bands that we're working with and why does dc have a music studio and that's when i was like you know stevie come down here and help me do this and you know i have partners in dc that necessarily didn't get how important that piece of the puzzle was and or you know wanted to invest in it at the time so i was like oh, i'm gonna just do it myself and that's why i built the studio and i've been you know from that point on that's like i've been diving into this for for a long time trying to bring and merge all these things together sure um last minutes we have like either of you just upcoming music um that that you want to promote upcoming um albums or, or singles um, anything that people can sort of look forward to keep an eye out for definitely yeah no got you know got the sublime project in late december and um like danny said just combining all these talents together like skateboarding and music like he saw something in that and that was the, something i was always trying to do that i'd never really seen before so now we got some people who are really doing that and uh so we got a lot of stuff coming i mean this whole new team that we have together is just pretty much an unstoppable force that we're gonna you know, we're gonna take over some stuff so uh, a lot of stuff to look forward to dolce and gabbana new song that i'm coming out with um should drop in a month and then bite marks out now so all right that's about that and then Good, i just dropped a single with my friend J uh, dre and zaba which is in this bubble this group with this girl called morgan justice yeah, that morgan. just went live like last week so there's a single right now you can find it on all platforms her name's morgan justice j-u-t-u-s right? yeah yeah so Just anyways, that's the most recent project that I helped collaborate with. We did it with Ethica, which is a, you know, sock underwear brand, big brand. And, uh, and then I have this track with little Tracy that's uploaded right now. And I'm waiting for these skateboard decks because I've made these limited edition skateboard decks with plan B for this little Tracy drop. And it's kind of like, these are, it's all happening right now. So, sure. um, well, as I say before, we could talk about this stuff all day, but at the end of the day, I just want to encourage people who are listening to to check out uh, Portash, to check out uh, what Danny Way is doing. Um, stay tuned for the Sublime Project. Stay tuned for some of the upcoming singles that these gentlemen mentioned. Thanks so much for coming on. It really has been an honor. Super Danny, fun. Thank really you so much. to meet you. Likewise, John, brother. Yeah. Looking forward to your next project. Thank so, you, man. Great to meet you. Thank All right. You. Right on, you guys. This has been another recorded episode of Stay Classy San Diego with your host, Steve Wire. Thanks again to our sponsor, Max Lux Media and MaxLuxMedia.com. Check us out at Stay Classy Pod com or any of our social media outlets. We're on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and everywhere else you get your podcast content. Please like and subscribe to our channel. It really helps us continue bringing you important content that you're not going to see anywhere else. And thanks to all of our listeners for tuning into the show. See you next time. Stay classy, San Diego.